Hello and welcome to this video and on this video I'd like to talk about the genius of Dave Brubeck. Dave Brubeck was a musician I grew up with, my dad was a big jazz fan and he was a massive fan of Dave Brubeck and so for me Dave Brubeck has became a touchstone for jazz, he represents the best that jazz has. Um, I think in the wider realm of uh, jazz history the critics haven't been so kind to a Dave Brubeck. I'm not too sure why that is. I don't know whether they saw him as too intellectual. Um, I don't know whether it was because he's a white musician, although there were black musicians in his band. I don't know if that played a part. I've always felt that he's one of the greats um, and not only did he sell a lot of records, and that might, might be another reason why the critics don't like him, uh, he's one of the biggest selling uh, jazz artists of all time, but he's also a pioneer in, in definitely two areas, if not three or four, he's a pioneer of um, of jazz. Um, to me, he really exemplifies the best of what jazz does. Um, with some incredible soloists in his band that um, really complement his way of playing. So what was his way of playing? Well, Dave Brubeck, um, I think he was born in around about 1920, I think. And he emerges in the late 40s. It takes him a while to find his, his way. He actually had an accident when he was quite young and that meant that he couldn't play the sort of fast flowing bebop lines. He is a product of the bebop era. But I think the fact that he wasn't able to play like somebody like Bud Powell um, meant that he had to find a different way of soloing. Um, he was a virtuoso musician, however, and he'd come up through the classical route. He'd studied um, at music college under Darius Milhard, and um, he was an incredible composer as well as a great player. But the fact that he was limited in, in, in the way he could play piano meant that he created an improvisational style that was based much more out of block chords and rhythmical interest. Um, Throughout his classic quintet, he was up against um, one of the finest soloists, I believe, in jazz history, the great alto sax player, Paul Desmond. And Paul Desmond is like the polar opposite of uh, Brubeck. He's, he's, he's just got this beautiful, liquid, um, legato sound. You know, um, somebody once described his playing as, as like drinking a dry martini. He really, Paul Desmond really embodies cool jazz. So what was cool jazz and what was this movement that Brubeck emerged in? Well, after the sort of frenetic style of bebop that had emerged in the 40s, jazz musicians wanted to try another way of playing. And uh, the great Miles Davis made an album called The Birth of the Cool, where he basically used bebop, bebop methodology, but he calmed it down and orchestrated it. It was a lot more stronger compositional element and arrangement element to The Birth of the Cool sessions. And he also used a whole bunch of West Coast musicians. Bebop had really come out of New York, but uh, over on the West Coast, there was a bunch of musicians like Jerry Mulligan and Lee Konitz that were playing in, in a style which was much calmer and cooler. The idea of cool jazz really comes out of Miles Davis. Um, Brubeck forms a quartet at this time, and he really embodies that cool jazz sound. And um, rather than go around and play the jazz clubs, he starts to gig around a Colleges. Um, the first album I'm going to pull out because I've got seven albums here. I'm sort of going to create the structure for this video. The first album I'm going to pull up, which is from 1954, I think, and it's the earliest album I've got on the list, is Jazz Goes to College. Right now, this doesn't feature the classic um, Brubeck quintet, and I will not be able to remember the uh, the bass players. But it's Dave Brubeck on piano, Paul Desmond on alto saxophone. Bob Bates on bass, and Joe Dodge on drums. And Joe, jo Joe Dodge is a very fine drummer. But unlike Joe Morello that comes in later on, Joe Dodge is a, just a real timekeeper, really solid, and it's a different sound. Um, but this is, a, this is a really great album, uh, and it really um, explores the relationship between, or emerging relationship between, um, Joe Morello, uh, sorry, uh, Dave Brubeck and uh, Paul Desmond. Um, and that's a really good place to start if you really want to get a uh, hang on what Brubeck was doing. And this is the album that sort of made his name. And this album was a big 
hit between uh, for um, college students uh, in the 1950s and uh, this was a favourite of my dad's. A lot of these albums are my dad's albums. He was, a, he was a big fan of Dave Brubeck. I got bought up on Dave Brubeck which is why I'm really chuffed to be doing this video on him. So that quintet uh, develops. Um, as I said, um, the replacement of Joe Dodge with Joe Morello sort of changes the nature of this band. Joe Morello for me is one of the greatest jazz drummers that's ever lived, especially from a technical level. He had two of the finest hands that have ever existed in drumming. Um, and he had a, um, an interest in um, world music, world music rhythms and odd time signatures. And um, odd time signatures have never really been used in jazz that much. Max Roche had explored them to some extent. But in the late 50s, this classic um, Brubeck Quartet, I could be calling it a quintet, it's a quartet, isn't it? There's only four of them. Um, this classic quartet made this album, and this is one of the biggest selling albums in jazz history. I am holding here an original copy that my dad bought in 1959 when this album came out. And this album, ex Time Out, explores our time and signatures. I think it's a testament to Brubeck's um, ability that he is able to not only make one of the biggest selling um, jazz albums in history, but also to make a, <laughs> the biggest selling jazz album full of bizarre time signatures. Um, this album opens up with the incredible Blue Rondo a la Turk, which starts off in 9-8. Now when I had this album as a kid, on the back it was really, because I had liner notes you see, and here, there, it explains how that time signature is created. Blue under a la Turk plunges straight into the most jazz remote time signature, 9-8, group not in the usual form, 3-3-3, three, 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 but in 2-2-2-3. And that last phrase, of course, is the standard way of grouping 9-8 in three groups of three. This album was like a, a light bulb moment for me to be able to read this. Um, then it's got Strange Meadow Lark, which is um, in a sort of three, but is on a 10 bar sequence, which is very rare. And then of course we have Take Five. Take Five was released as a single, and I think it went to number one in America, right? It's one of the first records in an odd time signature. This is one of the first number ones in an odd time signature. This is one of the first albums in the odd time signatures. This is one of the first singles in odd time signatures. But that's not enough. Right, at the same time that this album's coming out, uh, Miles Davis is bringing out Kind of Blue, which is using modes. But for me, the modal structure of Take 5 is far more advanced than anything Miles does on Kind of Blue. Sorry, but that's what I think. That's what I can hear. And the way Paul Desmond approaches that mode. So if we think of so what, so what is actually two two modes. I think it's D minor and E flat. Let's see, sorry, D Dorian and E flat Dorian, which is a minor mode, and it flits between the two. Uh, take five doesn't. Take five just stays in that mode, which I think is the Dorian mode, the same minor mode. Um, and the way that. Paul Desmond expands on that melodically is, is a lesson in modal playing. You've got to understand these jazz musicians that had grown up playing through chord changes and learned to improvise by arpeggiating their way through chord forms until they got to the point where they could improvise on those chord tones. Um, to then have to play where there's only one chord, how do you expand on that? Yes, you could expand on it by use of the mode, but then when, how do you... Where do you go? Where's your consonants? Where's your dissonance? And it's it's an incredible thing to listen to how Paul Desmond plays on that. He's such a great player that he, he really nails it so well. But then Brubeck solos as well, and Blue, Brubeck approaches it in his chordal way and his use of rhythms that, and counter rhythms that, 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 that work against that. And of course, on the uh, album version, we have Joe Morello's drum solo. Which again is textbook. How do you play on time signatures? You know, how do you use space? How do you use phrasing? This is incredible. Um, 
There's a lot of waltzes on here, there's a 6-4 on here, I'm just reading it through. But this is the album, if, if you really want one album by Dave Brew, but you're going to get this one, Time Out, it's an absolute classic album. Um, he follows that up with this, okay, Gone With The Wind, there is the classic quartet. Not quintet, as I was saying earlier on the video, I'm not starting again. Right, so there's the, uh, the classic quartet there. Here we have um, Gene Wright on bass, who only died a few years ago. I mean, I think he was nearly 100 at that point. Um, we have on here, I'm just checking, Joe Morello here, Brubeck here, and Paul Desmond here. Um, this is a concept album, right? A bizarre concept here, where the ultra-cool city slick, as you can see them, these, these city slick West Coast musicians, are actually plundering the music of the Deep South. Swanee River, Lonesome Road, Georgia on My Mind, Camp Town Races, Shortening Bread, Basin Street Blues, Old Man River, Gone With The Wind. Right, this is, it's, it's just pure genius. And these aren't just jazz standard renditions. Brubeck's such an incredible composer and arranger that he, he approaches things in such bizarre ways, you know. And if you check out how they play Shortening Bread on this album, you can hear the beginnings of, 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 of things that are going to happen in popular music. I, I really think that Brubeck's two pioneering areas is, is, is obviously the, the time signature stuff, but also the use of modes, the use of the studio. If you listen to a tune like on Square Dance, which is, is like almost like a hoedown, and the way they utilise the clapping, and then you get these sort of... Joe Morello does a drum solo on, on the rims of his drums and they pan it from speaker to speaker. This is all in the early 50s, late 50s, early 60s. And it's really great stuff. So I think he was using the studio in a really interesting way. A um, couple of albums from the classic um, quintet that were worth looking at. Jazz Impressions of New York. You want to check out Brubeck at the peak of his compositional styles. This is where he was asked to make, um, uh, to actually do um, uh, a soundtrack to a TV show. So it's, it's really in his compositional area. I can't remember the TV show, but I'll, uh, yeah, it was for a, a CBS television network series, Mr. Broadway. Uh, that's, um, and it features the classic this, uh, quartet. It was recorded in 1964. Um, and this, again, is a concept album which is based around the idea of New York. It's like a complete opposite of what we had with the album before. There's some fantastic um, compositional ideas. Um, and then a couple of years later, he did another album which explores the complete opposite of Time Out and it's called Time In, this album here. Again, it's full of... Um, Brubeck's compositions, and you can see him exploring 4-4 four, four on this album. Uh, this is one of the last of the um, classic quartet albums, and they, they dissolved uh, somewhere in the 60s, around about 65, 66, I think, although I'm not sure. Um, in the 70s, they did this reunion album. After Time Out, this is my second favourite um Brubeck album and it's this one here the 25th anniversary reunion of the Dave Brubeck Quartet absolutely incredible um, and there's sort of drawings of them as a little bit older you can see they've all grown their hair long and uh, you know embrace the 70s a little bit um, on here we have St Louis Blues it's a live album we have St Louis Blues which is a, one of the oldest jazz standards in history jazz history then we have three to get ready four to go which is off time out and is a you know is a waltz then we have with african time suite which is a, a a composition by eugene wright another great jazz composer then there's a salute to stephen foster which is a dave brubeck original then we get take five and it's a 10 minute version and they just take it out and then they finish off with another just jazz, jazz standard don't worry about me um the playing on three to get ready really shows you what a great quartet this was and how they had almost superhuman psychic ability to read what each other is going, are doing. Another really interesting thing about this album is that um, Joe Morello's drum, the drummer, his eyesight was never very good. 
and eventually he was pretty much blind by the end, by the time he was an old man. Um, I th I'm pretty sure, if you read the line notes of this album, that, that Joe Morello went blind playing this album. He was actually playing live, and he noticed his eyesight suddenly diminished. But he didn't care, he just carried on and got to the end of the gig and told them all at the end of the gig, I think I've lost my eyesight. Right. Um, one more album on my uh, exploration of Dave Brubeck. This is quite a recent album, and for fans of this site, it might be quite interesting. It's called Dave Brubeck, Young Lions and Old Tigers. All right? And here he pits himself against a whole bunch of different guests. Um, towards the end of his career, he trained up his sons to play in the band and, and I think Chris Brubeck was the bass player by this, which who was his son. I think his drum, his, his other son often would play drums, although he's not on this album. Uh, but this pits him against a whole piece, diff, um, range of new musicians and different guests and Brubeck has composed tunes for them. So we have on here a tune called Roy Hargrove where he gets to play with the late, great Roy Hargrove. And then he does a version of High, How High the Moon, which is a jazz standard with the incredible John Hendricks, one of the great jazz vocalists of all time. And then there's a tune called The Michael Brecker Waltz with Michael Brecker on tenor saxophone. There's a tune called Here Comes McBride with Christian McBride on bass. Um, Joe Lovano Tango with Joe Lovano on tenor saxophone. And then he does another jazz stand, In Your Own Sweet Way, which is a duet between him and the George Shearing, another great pianist from the 1950s, cool jazz era, who sold a lot of records. There's a track called Joshua Redman that features the incredible Joshua Redman. I don't think I've mentioned Joshua Redman on this channel, but he's, he's been a very important musician over the last 20 years or so, you know, makes some incredible jazz and incredible fusion. Number eight is another um, duet with the great Jerry Mulligan. Not Jelly, Jerry Mulligan. I'm having problems getting my words out today. It's, this is like the hottest day of the year. <laughs> and I'm sat here sweltering, you know, trying to talk to you. My, my mouth's all like this. So we try that. And not Jelly Mulligan, uh, but Jerry Mulligan on baritone saxophone. And uh, in the 70s, um, Jerry Mulligan for a time came in and sort of replaced uh, Paul Desmond in the group uh, and they made some great recordings. I've actually got a live album on Atlantic Records back there with uh, Jerry Mulligan which I nearly pulled out. There's a track called Moody which um, features the legendary saxophone player and flute player James Moody. Then we've got um, Jerry Go Round with another track but with full band with Jerry Mulligan. And then we've got Ronnie Buttercavoli, with the flugelhorn player Ronnie Buttercavoli. It's not someone I know, actually. I'm sure my knowledgeable fans will then tell me that I've missed out not knowing this person, but I don't know them, sorry. And then it finishes up with a solo piano piece called Deep in a Dream. There we go. So I've sort of um, given those of you who don't know Brubeck a sort of bit of an overview. I think he's an incredible musician. I think the virtuosity, the vision the composition, the, the incredible soloist that has passed through his band, including the two of the greatest musicians in jazz history for me, Paul Desmond and, um, and, and Joe Morello, and Eugene Wright as well. All, that classic quartet is just virtuosity, you know. And if you want to hear just beautiful jazz, to me, Brubeck really is the very definition of what jazz is for me. You know, if I want to hear some, some swinging jazz, you know, played by brilliant musicians, I'm gonna, I can go for Brubeck. So um, I think those musicians that have come up through prog or fusion and want to get into straight swinging jazz, Brubeck's a good place to start. I think there's a sort of conceptual continuity that goes through his albums and the uses of on-time signature and modes, which could make his albums quite interesting for progressive rock fans and fusion fans and of course the album to start with, out with is the multi-million selling time out so i hope you've enjoyed this video i hope you've been able to get through my tongue-tiedness that uh, have has crept in a little bit on this one i apologize for that but i think i've got through it um and um if you like the video please like 
Uh, if you want to subscribe, subscribe. If you like these explorations into more pure jazz, please let me know, because I'm sure these videos aren't going to do as well as my top 10 prog flugelhorn players or whatever the, this, the audience of this channel seem to like, but um, I think it would be, it's important to, to go and really get deep into the jazz, which is what we're doing this, uh, this month. And uh, if you want to support me, down there's a link to my Patreon. There's 50 videos there. And I, I, I really appreciate anybody appreciate anybody that um, becomes a patron because I would love to do this and the more patrons I get I get the more I can spend my time making these videos I would love to be able to spend more time doing them but of course we have to go out and do the day job don't we which uh, won't get done if I keep talking to you will it so I will go now see you soon